Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on such short notice. I hope that you and your loved ones are doing okay during this challenging time. My name is Susie Gelman, and I am privileged to serve as the board chair for Israel Policy Forum. As always, if you're new to Israel Policy Forum, I wanna welcome you. Israel Policy Forum is committed to educating policymakers and community leaders and to building support for advancing a resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict one that is based on two states in order to ensure Israel's security and its well-being as a Jewish and a democratic state. If you're not already receiving our updates and analysis by email, I hope that you will take this opportunity to sign up. Also, please be aware that we recently launched Israel Policy Hub, our new collection of digital resources, which you can find at israelpolicyforum.org forward slash hub, H-U-B. Even in the midst of today's unprecedented global health crisis, we are committed to continuing our work to serve as a credible resource for analysis to understand the dynamics in the region and ideas for how we may move forward to a more sustainable, secure, and peaceful future. I hope that you will also join us every Tuesday at 2 p.m. for our regularly scheduled weekly webinars. Tomorrow, Tuesday, April 21st, we will speak with Dr. Shira Efron and our own Evan Gottesman, the authors of Israel Policy Forum's groundbreaking new study, In Search of a Viable Option, evaluating seven potential outcomes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The news broke today that after three elections in the span of just one year, Israel finally has a government. But now the opposition is fractured and the coalition agreement calls for formal deliberations on West Bank annexation to begin on July 1st. We at Israel Policy Forum have been raising the alarm about the consequences of annexation for the past three years. And these latest developments seriously jeopardize Israel's secure Jewish and democratic future. To help us understand what happens next, we're joined by Israel Policy Forum's policy director, Michael Koplow. As always, we welcome your questions in today's discussion. If you're joining us via the Zoom link, you can click on Q&A to type out your questions. If you're joining by phone, please email your questions to info at ipforum.org. We will try to get to as many of your questions as possible during the time we have today. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael for some opening remarks. Thank you, Susie. So, um... As Susie said, uh, today, Bibi Netanyahu and Benny Gantz agreed to form a unity government. They have been in negotiations over forming unity government now for a couple of weeks, uh, ever since Benny Gantz was elected Knesset speaker. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, his Kachol Avan party uh, split into two. Uh, and he announced that he was going to begin unity union negotiations with Bibi Netanyahu as a result of the coronavirus emergency. It's been a couple of weeks, and um, since then, Gantz's mandate to uh, form a government has expired. The, the mandate to form a government uh, was now officially with the Knesset uh, in the period where any member of Knesset could try to get 61 MKs to form a government. But uh, despite the fact that his mandate had expired, Gantz and Netanyahu were still negotiating over unity government uh, over, over the last week. And, uh, today they reached an agreement, and the contours of that agreement um, are uh, largely as follows. It's a, there's a 14-page 14, 14 coalition agreement that they released, and uh, for those of you who read Hebrew, you should, uh, you should all go and read it yourselves. But uh, the, the basic breakdown is this. Um, it's an agreement uh, at the beginning solely between Likud and Kahol Lavan. Uh, it includes a prime ministerial rotation where... Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is Prime Minister for the first 18 months, at which point it reverts to Gantz for the next 18 months. Um, something that's important to note about that is that during the last couple of weeks of negotiations, Gantz had asked for some sort of legislation whereby if Bibi decided to call new elections and dissolve the government before that 18-month period was up, that Gantz would automatically become interim prime minister uh, and as a result be the prime minister in the transitional government as Netanyahu has, has done for the past year. So that element is in the agreement, but um, at least so far there is nothing in there about passing legislation that will formalize it. So 
Um, this is basically uh, right now uh, an agreement between Gantz and Netanyahu to do this rotation uh, in 18 months and for Gantz to become interim prime minister if, uh, if rotation doesn't happen. Um, but there is nothing in the deal that will automatically or legally require that yet at this point. Uh, the divide between the two parties, aside from prime ministerial rotation, uh, is that each side gets the same number of cabinet ministries. Um, at, the, at the moment, uh, there are going to be 32 ministers to start, 16 from each side. Um, and uh, after six months, that goes up to 36 ministers. Um, the reason for the, the six months is that during the first six month period of the government, it's designated as basically an emergency period to deal with coronavirus. And uh, there are no, no big far reaching policy issues are, are supposed, to be, uh, supposed to be taken. Uh, no big far reaching legislation is supposed to be voted on. Uh, there is however, one exception. And that as uh, Susie mentioned, is West Bank annexation. Uh, under the coalition agreement, and uh, also notable is that this is the only actual policy issue mentioned in the, the coalition agreement. Um, beginning July 1st, the Knesset and the cabinet can consider West Bank annexation proposals. Um, they are to be done in coordination with the Trump administration. Uh, and at that point, they can be debated on, voted on, and acted upon. Uh, and it explicitly says that no committee or committee chair can delay or try to hinder the uh, debate or voting on this legislation, which is meant to forestall it getting uh, held up in the, in the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee. So the one exception to the six month coronavirus emergency rule is annexation and, and the date for that to begin is July 1st. Um, some other notable, other notable elements in here. Um, there does not have to be a vote to transition the government or the prime ministry, I should say, between Netanyahu and Gantz. It's supposed to automatically happen after, after 18 months. Uh, when uh, Netanyahu is prime minister, uh, Gantz serves as deputy prime minister and as defense minister. Um, the ministries at the moment are also, as I said, split between the two sides. Uh, Benny Gantz as defense minister obviously means Kajol Avan has a defense ministry. Uh, Kajol Avan also has the foreign ministry. Uh, at least uh, until uh, until Gantz becomes prime minister. Uh, Kajol Avan also has the justice ministry. Um, Likud at the moment retains uh, the finance ministry, the health ministry, um, and of course the other ministries are also are also broken down, but those are, those are the most relevant ones for the moment. Uh, there is an interesting element with ambassadors, which is that whoever is prime minister at the time, so BB for the first 18 months, uh, and under the agreement, Gantz for the next 18 months, gets to appoint his own ambassador to Washington. But Netanyahu uh, gets to appoint right now a new ambassador to the United Nations, uh, ambassador to the UK, ambassador to Germany, um, and that will not transfer over. That, that stays uh, even when Benny Gantz becomes, uh, becomes prime minister. Um, the other important element to note is over judges because the two issues that uh, had been reported as stumbling blocks between the two sides were annexation and judges. Now, uh, annexation, uh, as, as I spoke about, Gantz uh, essentially caved. Uh, he went from saying that uh, he would have a veto over annexation uh, to now allowing it to be voted upon uh, freely starting July 1st. Uh, the other issue was judges. So uh, in Israel, there is a nine-person judges selection committee that, uh, that decides uh, Supreme Court justices. Um, and you have to have seven out of those nine votes to appoint anyone. Uh, and the way that committee is constructed is that uh, there are three current Supreme Court justices, two members of the Israel Bar Association, two ministers, and uh, two members of the Knesset. And traditionally, uh, one of those members of the Knesset comes from the opposition. The deal that, uh, that Bibi and Gan struck is that of those two ministers and then two MKs, uh, one minister is the justice minister, which uh, is going to be Avi Nisenkorn from Blue and White. The other minister uh, has to be a Likud minister. And then the two MKs, one uh, has to be a Likud MK and the other is going to be Tzvi Hauser, who uh, is one of the two members of Deraf Eretz along with Yoaz Hendel. Um, Tzvi Hauser used to be Netanyahu's cabinet secretary. Uh, he is one of the most right-wing members of the Knesset. Uh, the reason he was in blue and white was because he was opposed to Netanyahu serving as prime minister 
uh, not because he was left of center on or, or center even on policy issues. So what that means is that uh, between the Likud minister, the Likud MK and Svi Hauser, there is a block of three uh, very solidly right-wing people on the committee and recall that any block of three, because you need seven out of nine votes, uh, any block of three can veto any judge by themselves. So effectively Netanyahu um, and the right do have a veto over judges. Uh, also, um, a new attorney general, a new, new state attorney cannot be appointed uh, in the first six months, uh, which is, this is another issue that is very important to Netanyahu. And after that, I believe the agreement says that Netanyahu um, uh, has, a, has a veto over, over who gets appointed, uh, despite the fact that Kahol Avan controls the justice ministry. Um, so that is the, that's the basic breakdown. Um, as things stand, as I said, the BB is supposed to go for 18 months, gone for 18, and then, uh, and then elections are automatically called. Um, but uh, whether Gantz actually becomes prime minister after 18 months is, uh, is, is anybody's guess. One, one last thing I should note um, is that there is, an interesting, um, there is an interesting wrinkle in the agreement, which is that uh, there are biannual budgets. And if Gantz, while he is not prime minister, uh, ever votes against the budget, um, which means that the government automatically falls, Bibi in that instance remains interim prime minister, not Gantz. Um, so one may wonder, uh, one may wonder, given uh, that BB is pretty crafty at this sort of thing, uh, whether um, at some point in the first 18 months, he will present a budget that he knows for one reason or another, gods can't vote for, and then he, uh, under, under this agreement, remains in prime minister, even if the government gets dissolved. Thank you, Michael, for those remarks. And of course, uh, we already have some questions in the queue, but again, if you would like to ask a question, if you're on Zoom, please click on Q&A and type in your question. If you're on the phone, please email your question to info at ipforum.org. So, Michael, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions to kick it off. Um, one, as you noted, the coalition agreement references starting formal deliberations on annexation beginning July 1st. As we know all too well, previously, Benny Gantz stated he would only support annexation in coordination with Jordan the Palestinians and the international community, essentially a way to avoid supporting annexation without saying so. Any idea what happened to those caveats that Gantz had previously laid out? I think what happened is that um, Gantz really has no, had no leverage left. Um, he, was, he was very clearly scared of a fourth election. Um, I think it's probably a combination of scared politically for what would happen to blue and white uh, and also, uh, I'm sure, wanting to avoid a fourth election given uh, coronavirus and given the fact that going to a fourth election itself would be expensive and would also mean that, uh, that Israel could not pass a new budget. Um, so, uh, you know, he certainly had reasons to avoid a fourth election. Um, but once he split up Kahol Avan in order to start the unity talks or continue the unity talks with Prime Minister Netanyahu, um, that effectively meant that he, he had no leverage left really to insist on anything, especially since he telegraphed from the beginning that he was much more scared of a fourth election uh, than Bibi was. So, you know, given that, um, he obviously wanted to save his party. He obviously wanted to make sure that he continued with some sort of um, viable political career. And he obviously thought that uh, it would be better to be in government uh, than outside of it. Um, and so uh, his previous pledges on annexation are not the only, not the only casualty by far because um, Benny Gantz has, made a, a, has, has drawn a number of red lines over the past year, um, all of which he has gone back on, um, but this was one of them. And um, it's possible that Benny Gantz himself may still think that uh, any type of annexation uh, that is not done with the assent of the Jordanians or with the PA is a bad idea. Uh, but under this coalition agreement, not only can the vote go forward, but uh, it, it, it mentions um, coordination with the Trump administration as, as the only really necessary element. Um, and frankly, I wouldn't even be all that surprised at this point if that vote happens on July 1st or sometime uh, soon after, and that Benny Gantz himself ends up voting for it. 
Michael, one more question before I get to several great questions from our audience. Uh, before these latest developments, Kohol Levan was the largest, the second largest party in the Knesset. Now it's split with the Yeshantid and Telem factions remaining outside the government. How does the opposition rebuild from here? It's a really good question. Um, before the construction of Kahol Avan, uh, a little over a year ago, um, the, the opposition was Yesh Atid. And um, Yesh Atid was consistently 15 seats behind, behind Likud. Um, now, you, know, you had a more robust labor party. And when Kahol Avan was constructed, it incorporated Yesh Atid. It you know, presumably brought in new people with Benny Gantz and, and Gabi Ashkenazi. Uh, it very obviously cannibalized lots of votes from labor. Now, if you are an anti-BB voter or you are a traditional, um, you know, Likud, opposition to Likud voter, um, and you see what's gone on, um, obviously, Kacholavan is now in the government. Um, it looks like not Merav Michaeli, but uh, Amir Peretz and, and Itzik Shmuley, uh, two, of, two of the three remaining labor members of, of Knesset are going to join the government. So, you know, if you want to vote for the opposition, you're not going to, obviously not going to vote for labor, you're obviously not going to vote for Kahul Avan. Um, so that might mean a few things. It might mean that Yesh Atid ends up picking up a, a decent number of voters, you know, another five to 10 voters, per, uh, five to 10 seats in the Knesset perhaps. Um, it may mean that, uh, that Meretz um, gets reinvigorated. Um, it may mean more people for the joint list, or it may mean uh, yet another new opposition party, um, which is what happened last time, right? That was Kahol Avan. So um, tough to say. A at the moment, certainly Yair Lapid is, is going to be the leader of the opposition. Yesh Atid is going to be the opposition party. Um, and I'm sure that uh, Yesh Atid is going to do all that it can to, to capitalize on that and try to really turn itself into um, into what labor was, you know, in the in the 2015 and, and 2013 and, uh, and and before that cycles, um, where it was the, the main force against Likud. Michael, we have so many people asking more or less the same question: at which, What does this have? How's what's the effect on Bibi's prosecution on the trial? I believe it was supposed to start May 24th. Yeah, uh, and also now that there's some uh, control over who the next um, attorney general is and, and giving uh, control of the justice ministry or the judicial appointments committee, whatever it is. I mean, there's so many things that are wrapped up into this deal, this coalition agreement, but bottom line, what, what are the potential effects on BD's trial? Is it gonna go forward? Is he gonna seek immunity and not have a trial? And of course, let's not forget that the core principle on which Benny Gantz ran in three elections was that he would not sit in a government with an indicted prime minister. And I guess that went out the window today. So, Michael. Right. Um, so, yes, that, that, that last point, um, you know, that was, that was Cajol Avan's big, that was the reason for being, right? Um, that went out the window. Um, and really that went out the window the day that, the day that Benny Gantz announced that he, was, uh, that he was open to unity negotiations with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and, and considering a, a rotation where Prime Minister Netanyahu goes first. Um, so I think that's been, that's been gone for, for a while. Today may have been the, the final nail in that coffin, uh, but it, wasn't, it certainly wasn't, uh, wasn't the first hammer stroke. Um, it's difficult for me to see now a, a way in which the trial itself can be canceled. The, the only way that could possibly happen, I'm pretty sure, is if the state attorney agreed to drop all of the charges now. And that seems very unlikely. I think that you know, the trial is going to start. Um, it's possible that it will be postponed further because there is still an emergency situation in coronavirus and there's now sort of this official six month emergency government. Although it's also important to remember that the last time it was postponed the day before it was slated to start uh, last month, that was under Justice Minister Amir Ohana, who is a Likud MK uh, and an ally of Netanyahu. And now the Justice Ministry is going to be under Avi Nissenkorn. So um, even though you know, he is obviously going to be sitting in the government with Netanyahu, it's not quite the same thing. So um, I think it's likely that the trial is gonna start. Now, what Netanyahu has been focused on really has been making sure that he could remain prime minister while under indictment and while the trial is going on. 
the, the things that he thought were the biggest threats to that possibility um, were legislation that Kahol Laban had been threatening to introduce. And that mainly involved uh, two, two pieces of legislation. One would be that an MK under indictment could not form a government. Um, now, as soon as this government forms, as soon as this agreement is, uh, is fully fleshed out and, and the new government is sworn in, um, that will no longer apply. Uh, and obviously at this point, um, there are, wouldn't be votes for it in the Knesset anyway. And the other that he wanted to avoid was uh, legislation saying that a prime minister who was indicted had to step down. Uh, at the moment, that is the law for any minister except for a prime minister. And there was talk about passing a new law that would extend that same restriction to a prime minister. And again, if we're talking about um, what uh, what looks now to be, uh, I think it's going to be a 73... 73 person government, um, then obviously the votes won't be there for that either. So, um, you know, it looks like he's avoided that. Um, in terms of things like the, the judges selection committee. So uh, the Supreme Court uh, in Israel is, is slated to turn over over the next few years. And obviously uh, Netanyahu wants to make sure that there are um, right, right of center justices who are appointed. And uh, and ones who um, are unlikely to uphold legislation that says that a prime minister under indictment has to has to resign. Um, so I think that you know that's what he's looking for in terms of in terms of the the judges selection committee. He wants to make sure that he's going to be able to continue as continue as prime minister, and that his his indictments and trial aren't going to aren't going to impact that. And similarly, with uh, appointing an attorney general and a new state attorney. I think he wants people who are, um, if he decides that he wants to go for a plea agreement, I think he wants people who are going to be amenable to allowing, allowing him to perhaps negotiate some sort of plea that, that lets the charges go away and in return from leaving political life, which he, if he intends to actually do in 18 months, um, seems to be kind of a, a no-brainer for him to try and negotiate. And if he decides that he doesn't want to do that and that he wants to go back on his agreement with Gantz and call new elections, um, and not have you know the agreement that he that he signed today uh, be be enforced or, or be applicable, um, then I think in that situation, uh, you know he again he wants to have judges who will not uphold any type of legislation that may get passed that says he can't serve as prime minister or he can't form a government because he's under indictment. So um, at this point, I don't see how he cancels the trial. I don't see how he legislates immunity for himself given that he's already been indicted. I think at this point, the name of the game for him is continuing as prime minister, irrespective of what is going on with the indictments and what is going on with the trial, and basically giving himself more time to try to figure out how to, how to wiggle out from under his legal troubles. That's really what he's been doing for the past few years, and um, it's basically about extending the clock. And I think that uh, you know, with, with this deal that he signed with Benny Gantz, he seems at the moment to have done that pretty effectively. So we have a number of different questions on annexation, so I'm going to read you a few of them and then ask you to just form an, an answer to all of them. So Dove Eisner asks, he says, we always talk in maximalist or sweeping strokes when it comes to annexation. Why does annexing, for example, the Gush or Male Adumim endanger a two-state solution? He says there's a difference between the Palestinians not liking the borders of a future state versus having a path to a two-state solution. That's one question. Then uh, let's see, Jonathan Camel asks, is there any pressure that can be applied to prevent forms of annexation from the US or the EU? Uh, Jonah Nagby, Nagy, sorry, Jonah, when it comes to the cabinet in July, what will be the process of annexation? For example, how many MKs would have to vote in favor against or against in order to implement annexation in practice or prevent it? Um, Sorry, let me just go through a couple more just to try to cover all the annexation related questions. Stuart Blaugren, what is the likelihood there are 61 votes in favor of annexation in the current Knesset? And Julian Lederman, do you foresee any means or events that could allow Bibi to say, we tried to do annexation, but it didn't work, at least I tried, i.e. Corona will consume the Trump administration, a vote in Israel on the matter, fails for so, for so long, Bibi said a lot, but kept status quo somehow. Let me just see if there are any other aspects. Um, okay, Gabrielle Shusinski, how viable do you believe the annexation is starting with discussions and a vote moving forward on July 1st, especially in the middle of coronavirus? 
could public opinion sway this decision in the face of possible discussion of the Knesset prioritizing extending occupation when the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank are already suffering and could very well still be suffering from handling the coronavirus pandemic? Um, I'll stop there. And oh, Abner Goldstein, is there any way at this point to prevent the certainly negative result of annexation? Okay, so it seems like uh, three three questions there, um, basically, right? One is one is on the mechanics of this, um, one is on whether it can be prevented, and uh, and one is on what's what's the big deal if it happens. Um, so on the mechanics of it, um, it just requires a majority vote. It's not um, it's not subject to any type of super majority. Um, uh, it seems, based on the breakdown of this Knesset, that there there certainly is a majority of votes for it. Um, you know, you have the you have the 58 MKs from Netanyahu's uh, Netanyahu's right wing bloc. You add Orly Levy uh, as number 59, um, who, by the way, under the agreement that they signed today, is going to be one of the 16 uh, 16 Likud ministers. Um, you know, Orly Levy, who, who ran as part of uh, Labor Geshe Meretz a month ago. Um, so that's 59. And then you have uh, Tzvi, Hauer, Tzvi Hauser and Yoaz Hendel, the two Derek Eretz MKs who have supported annexation from the beginning. Um, so that's already up to 61. And that doesn't include anybody else within, uh, within Kako Lavan who may be in favor of the type of annexation envisioned in the Trump plan. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume that, um, that, that the, the answer to that number is zero. Um, as I said, I wouldn't even assume that when push comes to shove, Benny Gantz votes against it. Um, so I think the votes, the votes are, are certainly there. Um, in terms of, you know, whether it will actually happen on, you know, on or about July 1st and, and whether Netanyahu wants to play for time. Um, as I said before, we should, we should, in my view, be reading something into the fact that there is only one policy issue um, that is addressed in this coalition agreement. And there's only one issue that is um, not subject to this six month, uh, no sudden moves coronavirus rule in the coalition agreement, and that is annexation. Now, um, the folks on the Israeli right who are in favor of annexation understand very well that they need to do this under the Trump administration and that the Trump administration may not be around after January 20th, 2021. Um, and they wanna get this done. And in particular, it's not just getting it, getting it done under a friendly administration, it's that the administration has actually given them the precise blueprint for how to do it and um, what the parameters should be. So, you know, I think, I think assuming that um, after all this, um, and after Netanyahu has not only, you know, beaten the annexation drum now consistently for a year and formulated this plan with the Trump administration. And remember, you know, while the Trump administration was formulating it, uh, we couldn't say for sure whether it was be done, being done with the Israeli government or not. Since it was released, various members of the Israeli government have come out and, uh, and proudly talked about how they helped develop uh, members of the government and folks who aren't members of the government, um, outside advisors, have uh, proudly and openly talked about how they worked with, uh, with, the, United, with the United States team to develop it. Um, and you have this joint US-Israeli mapping committee that is, is mapping the contours of it. The idea that after all of that, um, and what's in this agreement, that somehow Netanyahu is gonna get to July 1st and try his hardest to avoid it or delay it or make it not happen or come up with an excuse. Um, is that possible? Sure, it's possible. Um, you know, I don't, I don't rule out anything, but I think it flies in the face of all of the available evidence that we have. Um, in terms of, you know, what can be done by the US or the European Union to deter it, um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure a whole lot. Uh, you know, if the United States or the European Union were willing to bring immediate and heavy sanctions to bear on Israel, that would deter it. Now, A, that's not something that's gonna happen. B, I want to make very clear that's not something that Israel Policy Forum um, supports or, or advocates happening. Um, and short of that, you gotta remember that the US Congress has, has passed resolutions um, 
putting Congress uh, on record as opposing annexation. The European Union is on record as opposing annexation. There are plenty of, plenty of bodies that are on record as opposing annexation. At the end of the day, the President of the United States is not only in favor of it, but you know, it is literally his administration is, is literally leading the charge on getting it done. So you know, it's tough for anybody to send a different message to the Israeli government that this is something that, that shouldn't be done or that the United States doesn't support. Um, I think that if, if the government of Jordan came out and said ahead of time, in no uncertain terms, we will suspend or cancel our peace treaty with Israel, um, and if Egypt did the same thing, um, that would probably, I shouldn't say probably, that would certainly give the Israeli government pause, but um, certainly the Egyptians aren't going to do that, and I don't think that the Jordanians are ahead of time going to threaten something like that. They have hinted at it, I think, because they want to use that as a way of trying to trying to prevent it, but I don't think they're going to be that equivocal before it happens. Um, so ultimately, if this is something that the Israeli government wants to do, um, it's something that the Israeli government is going to do, and uh, everybody should be very clear that Benny Gantz today um, enabled that happening. Um, irrespective of anything, any position he takes on annexation now uh, or going forward, um, this is sort of what, you know, what, what he's allowed to happen. The question about, you know, what's so bad if Israel annexes something like Malad Adami, Magush Etzion, you know, does that, does that destroy two states? Um, no, it doesn't destroy two states. Um, if Israel were to, were to, uh, were to annex Malad Adami tomorrow or annex Gush Etzion tomorrow, you know, those are, those are areas that we all know, know well uh, as ones that are going to be included in land swaps and any potential deal with the Palestinians. And so the idea that those will be part of the state of Israel in and of themselves do not, that, that, that does not um, fundamentally destroy a two-state solution. But there are a couple of things to note here. One is that the Trump plan for annexation isn't Ma'al Adumim and it's not Gush Etzion. It's 30% of the West Bank. Um, Ma'al Adumim and Gush Etzion together represent somewhere, I'm pretty sure, between one and 2% of the West Bank. So let's not kid ourselves about the contours of what we're talking about. It's not Mala Dumim and Gushetzion. It's 30% of the West Bank. It's an area somewhere around 15 to, uh, you know, 15 to, to 20 times um, Mala Dumim and Gushetzion. Um, second, it's one thing to take those areas as part of a negotiation um, and as part of a, a deal with the Palestinians. It's another to do it unilaterally. Um, and if it's done unilaterally, you know, people, people point to Gaza all the time as, um, as, as a mistake, as something that shouldn't have been done. The mistake in Gaza isn't that Israel, Israel withdrew from Gaza. I, I, I literally don't know anybody who today wants Israel to be fully occupying Gaza as it was before 2005. Um, the mistake was that it was done unilaterally and that it was both a full military and full civilian withdrawal. Um, now, doing something unilaterally like that, um, in this case, risks cooperation with groups like the Palestinian Authority, risks cooperation with a group like the Jordanian government, um, cooperation that is critical right now to Israeli security, um, and if you do it unilaterally and that security cooperation ends, so have you done something that in, in and of itself fundamentally destroys a two-state solution? No, but you have done something um, that upends and hurts Israel security. And you've also done something that makes it more difficult to get to that two-state solution because if you don't have the Jordanians and you don't have the PA as potential partners down the road, it makes it very hard to ever implement two states. On top of that, if you do that unilaterally, and it happens to be the thing that collapses the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian Authority, which by the way, right now, is undergoing a severe fiscal crisis, this was before coronavirus, is now dealing with coronavirus, as we know, has a crisis of, legit of legitimacy to begin with, and is extremely unpopular because it is seen as uh, abetting Israel's occupation without getting anything in return. If you then annex anything unilaterally, and the PA is seen as even more so uh, abetting Israeli occupation and now annexation without getting, it, getting anything in return. Um, 
you really run the risk of collapsing the PA. And if that happens, then you absolutely put a two-state solution, um, if not permanently at risk, very, very fundamentally on, on life support. Because at that point, Israel has to go in and take the entire West Bank, um, even if it only wanted Malad Dumim and Gush Etzion. And you know, once you've done that and reoccupied the whole thing, you are in just completely a completely different universe. So you know, it's very easy to look at, at, at small blocks and say, what's the big deal about unilaterally annexing those? But even annexing small blocks can have a, can have a real bad effect um, given a chain reaction. And again, we're not talking here about small blocks. We're talking about a lot more territory than that. I think that, I think that gets all the annexation related questions. Yeah, right? We have more, of course, but okay. so I'm going to pivot to uh, the U.S. political, the, the presidential campaign and potential ramifications depending on who wins in November. But before I get to those, Martin and Dick, hi Martin, also pointed out, you didn't mention that Lieberman, when you were talking about the math earlier, that Lieberman and his MKs would also vote for annexation in the Knesset, so that would put the majority at around 70 votes. So, so just to just to get to that point, and and, and now I kind of I kind of wish we had um, I kind of wish we had Martin live here because this is actually more of a question for him than, than it is a comment uh, a comment sure, from me. Sure. But um, but I but I've I have heard um, repeatedly uh, both from Martin and from members of his team from 2013-14 that um, Lieberman, who at the time was foreign minister, was the most um, helpful, compliant uh, member of, of the Israeli government at that point in actually trying to get to some sort of negotiation with the Palestinians. So, and, you know, we're, I'm sure many of us on this call are familiar with comments that Avigdor Lieberman has made in the past about uh, how he would be the first person to up and leave Nokdim, the settlement in which he lives, uh, if there was a two-state agreement with the Palestinians. So, um, so you know, I, I've actually always viewed Lieberman's um, stance on annexation as an open question because I'm not sure. I actually have never seen anything from him on the record either way. Um, you know, obviously, you know, he's someone who, who in the past has, has talked about and still does talk about separation from the Palestinians. I don't know, you know, the contours of what type of annexation he would vote for. So, um, you know, Martin, maybe you and I can have a discussion some other time offline <laughs> about Lieberman and annexation. But I'm actually, I, I, I've always thought of that as an open question as to whether Lieberman would give his votes to this sort of thing or not. Okay, so Martin had another question and um, he's not the only one. But Martin's question is, what would be the impact of Biden coming out against annexation and saying he would not recognize it if he becomes president? Martin Iram, if Biden's elected, what could his administration do to roll back annexation? And Jesse Ike asks, if the Democratic presidential nominee wins in the fall, how do you think this will impact the annexation efforts? In general, how should a Biden administration contend with the Netanyahu Gantz government? I think that if Biden were to come out now and, um, you know, he has, he has stated his, op his opposition to annexation, but I think that if he were to come out now and um, clearly state that uh, if he is president, the U.S. will not, will not recognize any unilateral annexation that, uh, that Israel carries out uh, and that is recognized by the Trump administration, um, that is something that would perhaps give the Israeli government pause, particularly if they thought that there was a greater than 50% chance that Biden will become president uh, next January. Um, so, you know, that could be something that would deter it, slow it down, you know, give, give folks in Israel um, who support it perhaps, you know, um, give them a reason to, to Give it a second look, or, or think about it. Think about it a bit harder. Um, I have no idea if that's something that the Biden campaign is is talking about, thinking about, open open to doing. But I think that that, that would perhaps have an impact. Um, you know, the same way that President Trump withdrew from agreements uh, that that the Obama administration uh, had had signed, uh, most prominently the Iran deal. Um, there's no reason why. Uh, Biden administration couldn't withdraw its recognition uh, of Israeli annexation of parts of the West Bank. Um, I think the question is whether that in and of itself would have an impact or, or whether something else would be required. Um, you know, as an example, Israel extended sovereignty to the Golan Heights in 1981. That's something that the United States 
never recognized uh, until last year, um, or I should say until 2018. Um, so the fact that the US had not recognized Golan Heights uh, application of sovereignty to the Golan Heights um, didn't, didn't force or cajole or spur Israel to, to change its policy there. So, you know, I'm not sure. I, I think that um, it would depend on what it means to withdraw recognition of annexed territory and whether that would carry any type of consequences and, um, and what it would mean for the U.S.-Israel relationship uh, writ large. But I do think that um, if uh, Biden were to say something now about what he would hypothetically do as president should annexation move forward, um, depending on what he said, I think that that would perhaps, uh, perhaps impact the, the tenor of discussions leading up to July 1st. So you, okay, I'm not going to ask you a follow-up on that point, but I do want to ask you a follow-up in terms of the political calculus in Israel right now around annexation. Because on the one hand, clearly uh, David Friedman, U.S. ambassador, is pro-settler and is leading this mapping effort in the West Bank, right? And that, that work, I assume, is going forward. And by the way, one of our audience members wanted to know, does Gantz get any uh, say in terms of who's serving on that bilateral commission? Remember that? No, that, 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 that committee is set. Okay, so he has no say. That commission, as far as we, that committee is proceeding in its work, as far as we know, right, Michael? Know, yes. Okay, so on the one hand, uh, I guess the powers that be in Israel could look at this as an opportunity while Trump is in office, for sure, to take advantage of what is perceived as a friendly attitude on the part of the Trump administration towards annexation as frankly embodied in the Trump plan. The other side of that coin is there could be a new administration voting, voted in in November. And why, why would the Israeli government, which certainly depends very heavily on not only financial support, military aid from, from the United States, but, but on a very strong U.S.-Israel relationship, why risk that in the summer months for a potential change in administration in January? I don't think that um, the Israeli government is, um, is worried that, that even under a President Biden, um, you, would, you would have suspension or, or um, withdrawal or conditioning of, of military assistance. That's a position that, um, that, that Biden on the campaign trail um, has not embraced. So I don't think they're, I don't think they're worried about that. Um, I think what they, what they see is that if he becomes president and they have not annexed at that point, um, obviously there will not be support from it from the United States. And that makes it harder because one of the reasons the political environment in Israel right now is so fertile for annexation is that you have an American president who has, who has given a green light and who has put forth a, a map and put forth a plan and said, you know, do this, this, and this, and, that, and that's fine with me. And that makes it a lot easier to argue for it, particularly arguing, arguing for support from people who are not hardcore annexationists. You know, put yourself in the average, the average Israeli shoes. You know, I was going to say right of center Israeli, but not even right, right of center Israeli. Um, you know, if you have a plan out there that allows Israel with U.S. approval to annex the big blocks on the Green Line and annex the Jordan Valley and extend sovereignty to, to all the settlements, um, you can see why that seems like something that is attractive when the United States president is saying, you know, do this with my blessing. And so getting, getting the public to support that, you know, even people who don't necessarily care about annexation one way or the other, right, it's easy to get them to support it if you're going to do it under those conditions. And so I think that um, the folks, listen, Naftali Bennett, he's a smart guy. Ayala Chakhed, very smart, very smart woman. The people who, who, who have been working towards annexation for the last half decade and kept it in the public sphere and pushed bills in the Knesset and made it the top of their agenda and um, made sure that the Likud base is, is on board and made it an issue in Likud primaries. These are all, these, these, aren't, these aren't dumb people by any means. These are all very smart, savvy, sophisticated people. Now, um, I think they're short-sighted about the risks of annexation, um, but that doesn't in any way make them not intelligent. They're very intelligent and um, they understand the political dynamics at work. And um, I think they, they rightly view 
if 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 they think that there's only that there's only uh, eight months left to the Trump administration, um, I think that they are um, they they rightly view this as their best opportunity to get this done, given the the opportunity presents to convince your average Israeli that it's a smart idea, and they don't want to let that opportunity slip away, and they're they're going to do everything they can to get it done. And as a follow up to that comment, Michael, is there anything? about annexation that could be reversed or rolled back if there's a different administration that's voted into office? Sure. I mean, I don't think that there's ever anything that, that 100% can't be rolled back, right? You know, we think about territories that, that different, different governments have held, um, you know, throughout, throughout history, um, right? The United States itself used to, used to be a, a colonial power. Um, you know, last last I checked, when we no longer we no longer uh, control the Philippines. So, um, of course, anything can anything can 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 be reversed. But um, but it's hard, right? Particularly when you're not talking about um, divesting yourself from a territory that's halfway around the world. You know, you're talking about divesting yourself from territory that is literally right next door and where um, you've applied sovereignty uh, to, to spots where Israelis have been living. Um, so I think I think it's it's harder to reverse in those situations. Not not impossible, but um, but certainly difficult. So um, Anna Langer has a slightly different question about annexation, which is what's the appetite for annexation among the Israeli public now, and what implications would annexation have on healthcare assistance for those in annexed territories during this COVID nineteen crisis? So the question about public opinion really depends on what, what question you're asking. Polling on this is kind of tricky. Um, if you ask Israelis whether they support separation or annexation, uh, you get high 60% that say they support separation, not annexation, as sort of a generic question. But if you break it down into different pieces and you, know, you ask Israelis, do you support annexation of Mal al -Dumim? I don't know the precise numbers, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that they're at or just above 50%. Or you know, do you support just same, same thing, right? So it depends what you're talking about. And, um, and again, when you're talking about a plan that has the blessing of um, the President of the United States, that's something that just that, that automatically creates, creates support for Israelis. Now, those are all things, of course, that are presented in a consequence-free manner, right? Because um, when you ask those questions, they're not asked, you know, do you support the annexation of this territory if it brings along the following potentially 20 bad things. And, you know, to be, let's be intellectually honest with ourselves as well, um, we don't know for certain that those bad things will happen, right? So, um, you know, it's difficult to say, but that's also one of the reasons why annexation is so dangerous because it can be presented as something that um, seems, like, seems like it'll be relatively painless. Um, but if it turns out that it is painful, it's very difficult to extricate yourself from it and to roll it back once it's been done. Um, which is why, you know, a lot of the debate around annexation I find frustrating because it's debated without, without any type of full accounting of what the potential consequences might be. There's always lots of mention of what the potential benefits are. Um, very rarely mention of what the potential, full potential consequences will be. And also almost never a debate around how easy it is to do it, but how difficult it is to reverse it should those bad consequences materialize. So, um, you know, I think on the public opinion question, all those things make it, make it very tricky. In terms of what the impact would be on, on COVID-19, um, presumably any areas that are annexed that contain Palestinians, um, Israel would have to adopt the exact same measures uh, for them and toward them as they would for any Israelis who are living in annexed territory. But, um, you know, the, the Trump annexation plan um, purposely uh, avoids taking in very many, uh, very many Palestinians at all. Uh, Norman Olshansky wants to know what influence will the Gulf states have on annexation, both pro and con? I think that if you had um, Gulf states like Saudi Arabia, um, Bahrain, Oman, come out, uh, UAE, come out, you know, ahead of time very strongly, um, and say we are opposed to annexation, and if it happens, um, you know, we will seize any backdoor uh, or private uh, cooperation with Israel. That would certainly have an impact. Um, I also am equally confident that uh, that those states are not going to do that. Um, 
because annexation isn't something that looms. I don't think they view annexation as something that will cause so much instability in their in their countries and among their populations that it will threaten their positions. Um, and they certainly benefit from the behind the scenes cooperation with Israel. Um, they benefit from it without really having to give anything because they, they kind of get the security and intelligence benefits um, without having to uh, assume the, the negative diplomatic consequences of, of recognizing Israel before there's any type of deal with the Palestinians. So there's really no reason for them to um, put their foot down unless they think that it will threaten their, their, their actual rule. And that's the reason why you have Jordan um, being so loud about this um, and being much more strident and vociferous about it than you really have any other Arab state because annexation really does threaten the Jordanian monarchy. And so they would like to avoid it, uh, you know, really as, as much as they can. We have a couple of questions related to how uh, this new government will impact on, have an impact on Israeli-Palestinians. So Ari Leibowitz asks, what impact will this new government constellation have on the Arab sector within Israel's citizenry? What, if any, responses have been expressed, either in print or otherwise, within that sector? And Barbara Lando asks, what is the likelihood that the next step will be arbitrary transfer of the Arab Triangle from Israel to the West Bank, and what would be the consequences of that? So that's the second question first, because that's, that's, a, that's a short one. Um, after the uproar over that part of the Trump peace plan, both the White House and Prime Minister Netanyahu disavowed it and said, that's something that doesn't have to be in a peace plan. They just threw it in there in case anybody's interested. But um, so I don't think that the Arab Triangle transfer is going to be part of any type of annexation. Um, on the first question, so you, know, you have to remember that the joint lists um, twice, twice in a row now recommended Benny Gantz for prime minister. Um, and they obviously see his joint precisely because they wanted to get rid of Netanyahu. Um, and so they see him joining with Netanyahu in a unity government as a, as a pretty big betrayal. So, um, you know, they're obviously not, uh, not happy with this. And um, also important to note that one of the reasons that they supported Benny Gantz um, for prime minister was because uh, Benny Gantz had, uh, had expressed uh, a pledge to try and amend the nation state law. Um, that was completely absent. You know, I, I talked earlier about lots of red lines that Benny Gantz had set that have disappeared. Um, you know, that's one that, um, that's one that uh, disappeared fully and, you know, fully and completely, no trace of it. Um, there was nothing in the coalition agreement about, uh, about the nation state law. Um, and the fact that it, uh, that the agreement ex explicitly prohibits um, any type of uh, major far-reaching legislation uh, for the first six months, you know, means categorically that the nation state law certainly won't be touched for the first six months uh, at a minimum. So, um, you know, the, uh, the, the Arab-Israeli sector um, is, is pretty disappointed, uh, has been disappointed with Benny Gantz now for a couple of weeks and um, is pretty disappointed uh, even more so today. Um, as a follow-up, and I'm just trying to find the person who asked this question. Sorry if I can't find your name right now, but uh, yes, Avram Sprung, and uh, who positions him or herself as leader of the opposition moving forward? Does Yair Lapid take up the mantle, or might all this result in greater Arab-Jewish unity and Ayman Ode as opposition head? Until there are, there are new elections, uh, Yeshati Talim is the largest party, so late largest opposition party. So uh, it, will be, it will be Yair Lapid. Um, you know, whenever there's a new election, whether it's in uh, 36 months, 18 months, 12 months, six months, um, you know, everything will get rejiggered and then we'll see. Uh, but at the moment, it's going to be Yair Lapid. Avi Poster, are we at all worried about annexation leading to another intifada? Listen, of course, that's a worry. Um, there's, no, there's no way of knowing. Um, I don't think that anybody can predict an intifada. Um, you know, whether or not there's an intifada tends to depend more on the Palestinian authority and its, its willingness to prevent one than it does um, in some ways on uh, the attitudes of, of Palestinians living in the West Bank. So I think the answer to that is that if annexation collapses the Palestinian authority, then it, it makes the chances of another intifada um, that much greater. And if it doesn't collapse the Palestinian authority, then I think it's a matter of whether the Palestinian authority thinks uh, that its route to survival depends more on preventing an intifada, which is 
um, which is the route that it's taken over the past decade, um, or whether there's so much pressure that it thinks the only way to survive is by um, releasing the pressure valve and, and allowing more protests and, and, and violence coming from the West Bank. Um, there's no way to definitively answer that question, but it's certainly something that everybody should be concerned about. And you know, it's one of the primary reasons why we think annexation is so dangerous, because even if you think that the chances of an intifada after unilateral annexation are only 5%, why in the world would you risk even a 5% chance or a 2% chance or a 1% chance, given how quiet things have been from the West Bank over the past decade? Mike, I'm going to turn to a question we got over email. Why is it the U.S., this is back to our discussion earlier about potential effect of our political uh, campaign on, on, and who emerges on, on what is happening right now in Israel. So the question is, uh, sorry, uh, why is it the U.S. responsibility or right to dictate Israeli domestic policy? Meaning these questions on what Biden should or should not do. I don't think it's an issue of um, the U.S.'s right to dictate domestic policy. Um, I don't know of any country in the world that, that doesn't take positions on, on what's best for its own interests or not. And traditionally, the United States has viewed resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and before that, the Israeli-Arab conflict as something that is in its interest. So something that negatively impacts the ability to do that, um, you know, pr presumably is something that is, that is not a U.S. interest. Um, I mean, certainly the Israeli government takes positions uh, all the time on, on things that, 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 uh, that other governments are, are doing or saying. Um, so that strikes me as a, as a, as a strange question. Um, certainly, certainly I am not, and neither is Israel Policy Forum, uh, suggesting, um, and I challenge anybody to find where, whether, where any place that we've ever done that, um, suggesting that the U.S. has to dictate something to the Israeli government and say, you absolutely you know, may not do this. Um, but given, given the fact that uh, what happens over there impacts U.S. interests, given the fact that um, we provide an enormous amount of assistance to Israel, both in terms of actual money and in terms of diplomatic assistance and in all sorts of ways, the idea that the U.S. shouldn't have an opinion or position on something that Israel is doing that uh, impacts the United States is, is a, bizarre, it's a bizarre position to take. We are coming up to the top of the hour. I'm going to ask uh, two final questions, Michael, and then if you want to just sum up at the end. So my good friend Dan Raviv asks, from a pro-peace point of view, is there good news here? 18 months from now, will the political tone and key policies of the Israeli government be significantly different, or will we simply be, see a different man in charge? The flip side of that, Mark Stanley wants to know, what if this is a trick and Netanyahu orchestrates a no-confidence vote as Gantz takes office? So um, on the first question, Benny Gantz is, is under this agreement going to serve as defense minister for the first 18 months. At the moment, Naftali Bennett is defense minister. Now, that will absolutely have an impact on West Bank issues. Uh, the defense minister um, traditionally has more power and authority and impact over what happens in the West Bank than the prime minister does. Um, Naftali Bennett as defense minister has done everything he can to lay the groundwork for annexation and to increase Israel's control um, over various parts of the West Bank. I expect that Benny Gantz will not have that same zeal. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of that, I think that um, that may be helpful from a peace perspective, but, um, but certainly it, it's difficult for me to see, given the way this uh, coalition agreement deals with annexation and, and given everything, um, difficult for me to see how this paves the way for any change in the Israeli government policies with regard to kind of peace writ large um, and resolving the Israeli, the Israeli Palestinian conflict, even if um, leaving aside the annexation components, it means um, for, for more fruitful policy on the ground in the West Bank um, than you know, under a defense minister Gantz than we've seen under, under defense minister Bennett. Um, on, uh, on Mark's question, hi Mark. Um, I absolutely think, I mean, if I wasn't, uh, I've alluded to this, but I'll be a little, a little more clear. Um, I do not think that Benny Gantz is going to become prime minister in 18 months. Um, I think that uh, well before that time, Prime Minister Netanyahu will figure out a way to uh, create a crisis, to dissolve the government, to call elections. Um, as I said, he has that uh, at the top, as I said, he has that, uh, that little piece built in where if Benny Gantz ever votes against the budget, um, 
then the government falls and uh, Bibi becomes interim prime minister, not Benny Gantz. Um, and because at least so far, there is no legislation enshrining this 18 month rotation and enshrining Benny Gantz taking over as interim PM if that rotation doesn't happen and if elections are called, Netanyahu can, if, he's, if he cancels the agreement uh, for the rotation and for this, to, for this to go for 36 full months, then there's no more agreement. There's nothing holding him to making Benny Gantz interim prime minister during that period. So um, listen, Netanyahu is a wily guy. He's, he's, he's been prime minister for well over a decade. Um, he, is, he has eviscerated and embarrassed every, every significant opponent that he's had, both within his camp and outside of his camp. Um, one of his favorite tactics has been to invite his opponents into the government, uh, whether they be Shaul Mofaz or Tsipi Livni or in 2013, Yair Lapid, um, and basically chew them up and spit them out. Um, and I think that uh, Benny Gantz's fate is likely to be similar. Um, but we'll see. Michael, any final words before I wrap this up? I'm going to say some closing remarks, very brief closing remarks to thank everybody, but you um, have final thoughts. Just that, um, you know, as, while, while I've outlined lots of, lots of reasons why I, I am not um, terribly pleased by what transpired today, I think uh, we should all at least be happy that um, Israel will have a government that is not a transitional government and one that will be able to pass a budget that will deal with coronavirus and hopefully it will, uh, it will enable Israel to deal with the crisis in front of its face. Um, in a more robust manner. And, and hopefully, as we get to July 1st, uh, the Israeli government will um, have the wisdom not to create uh, a different sort of crisis. So I'm going to end with a couple. Thank you, Michael. I'll end with a couple comments. First of all, Avi Poster wants to know, when will this call be posted for sharing with others in our advocacy circles who will benefit from learning from Michael's outstanding insights? So um, we will be sending around a link. This is a recorded webinar, and we'd be more than delighted for you to to share it uh, far and wide. Michael, thank you and thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. We had a very uh, large group of people. I think we had about 350 people um, on very few hours notice. So thank you everybody. For those who sent in questions that I didn't get to, I apologize, but you all had such great questions. I tried to cover as many as I could in the hour. And again, as a reminder, we're continuing with our regular every regular Tuesday video briefing series, including tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, featuring Israel Policy Forum's Dr. Shira Efron and Eva Gottesman discussing our new study in search of a viable option, which is certainly more relevant today than it was when we published it uh, in late February. Uh, you can register at ipf.li forward slash April 21, 2 1. And you can also find links on our Israel Policy Hub website at ipf.li forward slash hub. As the Israeli government pushes ahead with annexation, I also want to remind you to visit our Annexation Watch resources on our website, which feature analysis from Israeli security experts on the economic, security, and institutional consequences of West Bank annexation. You can go to that at ipf.li forward slash annexation watch. Finally, if you find our webinars and our digital content and resources useful, please consider supporting our work. If you already support Israel Policy Forum, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you all again very much for joining us and be well. Thanks, Susie. Thank you.